Hey folks, Richard here and welcome to the channel. In this video we're going to be having a look at the GPU technology which sits at the heart of Microsoft's Xbox One console. Now I've already taken a look at the AMD hardware that powers a PS4 and what its comparable PC equivalent is and this video is going to take the same sort of format. So let's get one thing out of the way first. The Xbox One GPU is simply not as powerful from a technical standpoint as the PS4 but that doesn't mean it's not capable and it's actually pretty interesting to see the direction that Microsoft has took when developing the graphics technology for our console. The GPU I'm going to be looking at today is the AMD R7-260X, which is essentially a rebrand of the HD7790. AMD released the HD7790 in March of 2013 and rebranded it later in the same year as the 260X. Now even though it was very much focused at the lower end of the gaming market, it was praised for the performance it offered for the cost, and being offered at around about $50 less than the mid-range HD7870 meant it was fairly popular with those lower end budget builders. Built on a 28 nanometer process and based on the Bonnier XT graphics processor, it features 896 shading units, 56 TMUs and 16 ROPs with a 2GB GDDR5 memory buffer on a 128-bit memory interface. The clock speeds will vary slightly depending on your manufacturer you buy, but the core is generally clocked around 1.1GHz with the VRAM hovering around about 1.6. The end of 2013 was also the year that Microsoft released its Xbox One console and within its APU we can find a very familiar 28 nanometer Bonnier based graphics processor. This GPU features 768 shading units, 48 TMUs and 16 ROPs. The Xbox One as a whole has access to 8GB of DDR3 memory which is shared with all its components on a 256 bit memory bus. On top of the standard frame buffer, the console has access to 32 megabytes of super fast ES RAM. The GPU operates at a frequency of 853 MHz, although if you've got the 1S you can bump that up by 61 MHz to 914. Much like what Sony and AMD did with their 7870 GPU on the PS4, the Xbox One GPU is architecturally the same as the 7790 or the 260X, but with two compute units, each featuring four texture mapping units or TMUs, disabled. Like with the PS4, this is simply done to increase the yield numbers within each batch. What the Xbox One does enjoy over the 260X is an increase in memory bus width, although the use of the slower DDR3 memory instead of GDDR5 means that the Xbox One still has significantly less bandwidth than the PS4 or even our 128-bit PC GPU. Microsoft has tried to mitigate this deficit with inclusion of the 32 megabytes of ES RAM, and if a game is properly coded for this, it can actually help bridge the gap a bit. With the general specs out of the way, what's clear from the off is that the Xbox One GPU has been customised to a higher degree than what Sony did with the PS4. So what does this mean for our 260X? Well, we can in theory exactly match the floating point performance of the Xbox One GPU. Now I say in theory eh, because we couldn't actually underclock our 260X low enough for the system to remain stable and keep it at the Xbox One levels, which would have required us to run the core clock at under two thirds speed. Now this really shouldn't come as too much of a surprise though for a couple of reasons. The main one being that unlike the PS4 which disables two compute units from a pool of 20, a 10% reduction, the Xbox One disables two from a pool of 14 which is about 15%. This means that we need to underclock our 260X further away from the base clock to achieve the same floating point performance. In the end, a stable clock speed of 750 MHz was found, which puts the floating point performance right dab in the centre between the Xbox One and the One S. To achieve memory parity is a little bit harder, seen as the Xbox has two available pools of memory. If a developer does not use the high speed ESRAM, the bandwidth has got to be around 60 GPS. However, from developer interviews I found online, if the ESRAM is properly implemented, it can be comparable to a solution that can push around 140 to 150 GPS. Now, the 260X has a memory bandwidth of around about 104 GPS, so it kind of falls somewhere in the middle of the best and worst case scenario. So we're just going to leave it there. Like the video on the PS4 GPU, removing the CPU is a bottleneck, will allow us to see what these GPUs are actually capable of. So let's run through a few of the benchmarks with the set and set console comparable data levels are above and the frame rate of the Xbox One console is also going to be listed for comparison. And we're going to test everything at 1080 and scale the clock speeds of the GPU from the console representative 750MHz and step it back up gradually to 1150MHz which is the base clock of the 260X. So first of all we've got Tomb Raider 2030. 
15 set 1080p on the Ultra preset with a few other options enabled. And as we can see at the 750MHz baseline, we're getting about 42 FPS on average. Now if we increase the clock speed back up to the base clock, we can see we're almost hitting 60 FPS on the 260X. Now Skyrim SE next and our Xbox One representative 750MHz is getting us just above 30 FPS at 1080p on the medium preset. Turning the clocks back up to that base level sees a 10 FPS increase in average frame rate. GTA 5 now and we've tested it at 1080p on the high preset and our representative base clock 750MHz returns a value of 36 FPS on average. Now this is one of those games that certainly benefits from the higher clock speed, as we can see we're almost hitting 60 FPS when we clock the 260X back up to that 1150MHz. Finally, we've got Battlefield 1. Now this is quite an interesting game because the game on the Xbox One, it actually employs a scalable resolution and it does it on the fly. So the game is always going to want to try and hit that 60 FPS. So it renders natively at 900p, and as you can see when we clocked our 260x at comparable levels, we was averaging about 42fps. Now that's not to say that the frame rate didn't actually hit 60fps, sometimes it was more, this was just the average, and since the game tries to keep everything at 60fps, it allows it to scale down to 720p, which we can see from our results was much closer to 60fps on average. So the Xbox One, when you're playing, normally it's got to be 900p, but in that intensive scene, it'll actually scale down the resolution to 720p in order to maintain that average FPS as high as possible. For reference, at 1080p we managed to sneak just above 30 FPS when clocked at the Xbox One's levels. Moving back up to the original base clock, we see that at 1080p we're almost hitting 50 FPS on average and 900p is entirely playable with an average of 63 FPS. So what can we actually take from this? Well, first of all, is that even though both these consoles of this generation employ very similar hardware and architectural level with an AMD X64 platform, the approach to graphical horsepower has been quite different. Whereas the Xbox One employs a low-end GPU which has both been scaled back for reliability reasons, it has also scaled it up for that performance increase. Sony's approach though are taking the higher-end hardware and simply scaling it down, it seems to be yielding better results this generation. What I have found interesting in this is, regardless of what Microsoft says, the hardware chosen is firmly set at a level that's much more comfortable with 30 FPS at HD resolutions, with 60 FPS only really being achievable at sub HD. For what's worth, I quite like the console, and like the PS4, it's all down to the games that are on it, so if you've got one, just enjoy it, but don't wade into a spec war. Now I hope you've got something out of this video and you found it interesting, and if you've come across this video as a console gamer then I'd love to hear from you, I'd love to hear if you think that Microsoft has kind of dropped the ball with the Xbox One this generation, and if they think they're going to have learned anything from skimping on the hardware when it comes to the Scorpio. Likewise, PC gamers, would you folks still consider something like the 260X or 7790 as a viable option in 2017? Anyway folks, I think I've rambled on enough for one video. Tell me what you thought of it in the comments below and using those thumbs, and if you've not already, you can consider subscribing and checking out some of the other content. As always, thanks so much for watching this channel, and I'll hopefully see you all again soon.